Hey, welcome back to the Life Changes Channel podcast. I'm your host, Dina Court. And did you know you are listening to the number one divorce podcast in Canada? We rank consistently in the top two or three or top one even of the podcast every single month. And that is thanks to you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for trusting us with your time and knowing that you're going to find credible resources here on the podcast, as well as in the publications that are available, Divorce Magazine Canada and Life Changes Magazine. We have a YouTube channel, social media, and newsletters as well. So every single month, there is something new coming to you with credible resources, information you can trust, and th ways to empower yourself with this information. So you aren't feeling stuck, you aren't feeling alone, you know that this will help you move through whatever challenge or change that you are navigating with less stress, less cost, and less time. We're here to help you. Please know you aren't alone. Today, I'm bringing back a guest that has been on the podcast before. She's in featured in the magazines. You'll see her in the newsletter. Nikki, she was Nikki Pike. She's Nikki LaBerge now. Though. That's one of the life changes that she has recently gone through. And let me tell you, changing your name is a challenge. Nikki is here because through her life experience, through her education, she has a degree in psychology. She's also a mortgage broker and has many years, I think it's over 17 years now, as a mortgage broker, that experience of actually specializing to help women who are dealing with a divorce situation. And now she is creating a new and has a new program available for you to help you with the what next okay, what next? Through the divorce, who am I? How, how do I rebuild my life? How do I heal from this? And that's what she's now created for you. So I'm really excited to bring you this news. It's just a beautiful, natural uh, transition for her to now offer this type of uh, service for you and this type of opportunity to figure that out for yourself. I love how this has just been a natural phase of, of her life. I've been through that when I've been uh, come out a divorce and trying to figure out, okay, who am I? What next? How can I use what I've learned to help others? And that's why I do what I do is connect you with people like Nikki and all the other incredible guests that are on the podcast and are featured in the magazine. I encourage you to check all that out. Links are all in the show notes. You know the routine. Have a look. Scroll through there. Just click on them and it'll take you right to them. Okay, let's talk to Nikki. Welcome, Nikki, back to the show. It is always a pleasure to spend time with you. And you have some exciting new direction that you are taking in the services that you offer. And I think it is just such a natural fit and a natural progression. And it's something that you've obviously identified a need for, and you're qualified to help people in this way, especially women. So welcome back. Please tell us what you've been up to since we last spoke and what is on the horizon for you. Hi, Dina. Thank you for having me. And I feel like I could answer that question with about two hours of time and talking, <laughs> but I won't do that. Um, so to give you just a quick update. So for those listening, I've been a mortgage broker for the last almost 18 years. And the last few years of my time helping people with their mortgages, I started to kind of specialize in helping women with their mortgages and then specialize a bit further in helping women going through divorce with their mortgages and having these conversations with these women and listening to their stories. I read it, they resonated so deeply within me because I'm divorced. And so I know how difficult that time in your life is. And if I go back to my roots, I have a degree in psychology. So my university days, I was all about helping people. And I do feel that mortgages have allowed me to help people over the years. But again, the last couple of years, it's just a bit of natural progression to helping women, helping women going through divorce with mortgages. And now I'm taking that a step further and coaching women that are who are going through a divorce or who have gone through a divorce, just helping them really reconnect with who they are, understand their patterns, understand their limiting beliefs, and really rediscover who they are and help them move forward in who they are now. 
That is exciting. There is a huge need for that. It's a time of such limbo and confusion and embarrassment and shame and guilt and failure and all these things that they dump on themselves. And it's that's natural. So, you know, don't be blaming yourself if you're listening to this and you're feeling some of those and thinking that that is a weakness because that's a just that's a natural reaction that is uh, to be expected. And if you are aware of it, that's the start. Wouldn't you say, Nikki, like just noticing that you're feeling that way is is good instead of just feeling so low and so alone and so frustrated and you don't know why. Yeah. And you don't know why, and you don't know how, and you don't know where to turn and you don't know all the things. And then your life is feeling like it's turned upside down. So there's an element of chaos there as well. And having someone that can really help you identify those patterns. And when you're, you know, for me, I would, I would call it my spiral. One little thing would set me off and I would go into the spiral of my life, <laughs> just spiraling down when it was just one thing that set me off. So again, having someone that can be there with you and say, okay, well, let's talk about that one piece that set you off. Why did that set you off? Let's uncover the reasons behind that. And then there's lots of really cool stuff available to help us release emotions stored in our bodies. Because I think that's part of the self-awareness is so many of us now are intellectually aware and we're consciously aware, but we're aware from the neck up. We're not aware of what's going on from the neck down. And it's about sometimes just dropping into our body and listening to our body and be like, oh, where am I feeling this? What does it feel like in my body? And why am I feeling this here and there? And, and then releasing it. I'm happy you went that way with the conversation, Nikki, because I was going to ask you, what are some signs that we can be watching for? Because yes, we talk about it a little more openly. We, we will support others, but it's really tough to admit it for ourselves that I'm feeling this way, feeling, you know, frustrated or confused and angry, whatever the emotion might be. But then maybe there's something in our body that we're ignoring that we don't have to just tolerate and put up with. It's something we can dig in and notice. Is there a pattern that is perpetuating this, that is keeping this locked into my body? And how can I heal? Because eventually these things turn into disease. Yes. And women have a higher chance or we have a higher, higher levels of di diagnosis on things like autoimmune diseases because of how we internalize things. And, you know, I mean, in society, we're not taught to talk about our emotions. We're taught to shove them down and go on with life. And it works in the moment. I mean, most of us are masters at it because we've had to be. It's like, oh, I'm feeling something. I don't have time for this. Shove it down. On I go with my day. And then we never go back to it. And it's not an easy thing to do to sit with these emotions, but if we can actually sit with them and recognize them and all the lingo, name them, all of those things, and then actually work to release them, that's how we actually get to move on with our lives. I feel like we need to have a big girl panty burning party because <laughs> we're, we're like, we'll just pull on your big girl panties, but yeah. that equals the message behind that is often, not always, it's often, we'll just push it down, take a deep breath, step forward, you got this, you know, just ignore, <laughs> ignore what the, the negatives are, or ignore where you're at, and just, you know, toughen up. And yeah. that's what you're talking about, that pushing it down. Well, it's the pushing it down. And it's the living in survival mode, because we have to, Right. And I think when we're going through a divorce, especially if there's kids involved, there is so much going on. Lots of times you're moving, you're selling a house, you're refurnishing something new. You're, are you, can you buy? Do you have to rent? Do you have animals that you need to factor in? Obviously, the kids are a huge part, again, if there are kids involved. And so lots of times the only way that we can actually get through it is to shove stuff down. And that's why a lot of the coaching that I'm doing it can help some women during the divorce. It's really meant for kind of more. I want to help women come out of survival mode. We need to be in survival mode at certain times yes. in our lives. And it serves us really, really well. But what happens when we don't need it anymore? But we think we do, but we don't, right? So it's like, oh, wait, this did really well. This really helped me, but I don't need to live there anymore. There's another way. So yeah, don't set up camp there. And again, hmm. I'm happy that you emphasized 
those times are important. That's 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 a natural progression through these stages is you are going to be in survival mode at certain times, especially if you're a mom to littles or you have children at home and so much more that you need to consider. So don't beat yourself up around that. It's that's okay, but let's not stay stuck there. And you don't have to stay stuck there. You know, you might be looking at if there's abuse involved. Sometimes that process is far, I mean, obviously it's far less safe there's higher incidence of uh, the abuse escalates and is even more dangerous during and post-divorce. You are trying to co-parent with someone like that, whether it's abusive or not, it's, there's still this underlying um, tension and it, it's easy to be on that alert all the time and um, in that survival mode. So having someone to walk you through those stages and help you recognize that maybe you don't need to respond to that text or let's just pause. You don't owe them an explanation for where you're going, say, or it, it, there's there's some patterns that maybe you're locked into, like you were saying, that are not healthy for you. They aren't healthy for your family environment, your children. And it's just really reassuring to know that someone who's been there can help them. And I love that you have a psychology degree to back this up. You have experience personally, you've worked with women more specifically around divorce with your mortgage broker role. So you really bring a lot of different components to this that, that can really support women. Yeah. And I think the support is a really big part. Um, you know, you used some words at the beginning, shame, failure, guilt, um, those emotions when it comes to divorce are really real. And I do think the stigma around divorce is shifting because obviously it's a lot more normalized. It's a lot more normal today than it was before, but there is still a level of failure that's associated with it. There's still a level of shame and guilt, especially again, if there's kids involved, mm -hmm. because I know for me still, however many years later, I look at my daughter sometimes and I'm like, like, did I fail you? Did I fail you by not being able to make our marriage work? And then I have to have that reminder that, no, it wasn't a healthy environment to raise her in. And, you know, we do our best to co-parent. It's also not always the healthiest environment, but we're doing our best. And that's where like, I'm such a firm believer in coaching. I've had numerous coaches since my divorce um, and during my divorce. And that also has led me here because I don't know where I would be without those coaches at really important times in my life and the support that they were able to give me. And the tools that they were able to give me along with my therapist. And that's the biggest thing too, is this is not coaching is not to take the place of therapy. It is not to take the place of other professionals in someone's life and their healing journey. It is a supplement. It's another addition, another thing that you can choose to help you heal and grow and move on with your life. But it's meant to work in tandem with therapy and professionals in that capacity as well. So for some people, it really is the missing piece, if that makes sense, right? We go to our therapist and it's talk therapy and we can talk through things and we can get tools and we can walk out and use those tools and feel better. This is really getting into the body and again, releasing that trauma, releasing those stored emotions, identifying those patterns and those limiting beliefs, working with the nervous system, regulating the nervous system. And then the fun part is like, that's the work part is, you know, like, the diving into the limiting beliefs and the patterns and, and releasing those emotions that actually healing is work. And that's the work part. And then, you know, then we get to a little bit more of the fun part, which is what is self-care to you? What does self-care mean to you now that your life is different? How do you support yourself and moving into like, who are you now? I know when I went through my divorce, a coach asked me like, who are you? If you strip away the labels of wife and mom and mortgage broker and all these labels and I had no answer because I didn't know who I was without those labels. I was those labels. I wasn't Nikki. And it took me two years to be able to answer that question of like, who am I? And now it's one of my favorite things to talk about with people. Like, who are you outside of your labels? And it shouldn't be hard to answer, but it is. It's super hard. I remember being faced with that question and having no answer. And feeling so empty mm -hmm. that all there was was tears. That was the answer. And just complete emptiness. I don't know. I'm not. And my answer 
after I sat in that for a minute was I, I am, I'm nothing without those labels. That's where, that's what I felt. Mm -hmm. I am nothing. If I can't prove my worth by fulfilling those roles, I'm nothing. I have no purpose here. And that's pretty heavy. It's very heavy. It's a hard spot when you face that, but to face like, and I didn't face it alone. I, that was in uh, with a therapist, thankfully, but anybody listening to this, if you are asking yourself that you're not alone, don't, don't stay stuck and sitting in that, that feeling of, I, I have no purpose outside of the roles, the people I please and the people I take care of. And, you know, who am I as, as a human, as a human. And I think too, sometimes when we really identify with these labels, we also really identify with our story. So what has our life looked like to this point? What is our story? And sometimes our story serves us and sometimes it doesn't. And if we're really attached to that story, especially with divorce, you know, it really changes your whole world. But yet if you're stuck to those labels in your story, it's really hard to move forward. Mm -hmm. And it takes, I talk a lot just in all parts of my life about consciously choosing. And again, you have to be aware of certain things before you can consciously choose, but it's yes. being aware of those patterns, those feelings and being aware of our story for a really long time. I was really stuck in my story of my divorce, losing my mom and losing my brother. Like that became my story and almost my identity. Like, well, I'm the woman who got divorced and then her mom died and then her brother died. And that's just who I am now. Yeah. And it took me a long time to be like, those things happened. I survived those things, but that's not like, they don't have to define my story. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like separating my story from, yes, those things happened. And yes, those are a part of me, a big part of me and a big part of who I am today, because if those things wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't be who I am and where I am and those things, but it's just, sometimes we just have to really shift things. Yeah. That's where having someone to walk you through that is going to be a life changer. It'll go yes. quicker. It's less, it, it, probably less painful because you are there to help them identify, oh, is that a pattern? And you catch you before you spiral too far. And, yeah. or even if the spiraling starts, it's like, okay, so now I know I'm spiraling. What is the story here? Right. What is the, what are the facts in this story? And what am I making? Like, what am I, what is real? Essentially, what is real? And what am I making up because of my story? Yes. What am I putting into this because of my story? And once you can start to split those things be like, oh, okay, this is the story I'm putting on this, but this is like the only truth that I know. And if we can just kind of focus, it's probably one truth in this whole big story that we've spun. Yes. <laughs> and if we can look at that one truth versus the story, we can start to pull ourselves out of our story. I don't know if the listeners are familiar with the work of Byron Katie, who talks about, you know, is this true? Is this hundred percent true? Do you know it's true? What are some, what are some ways that a listener could start to notice these things in themselves that, you know, today as they're listening and then they like, how can they question that truth? Do you have a, a tool you could share with them? Honestly, journaling. Journaling is such a huge thing. So two kind of parts to it. Um, as we start this work, once you start to feel something, and again, you got you have to be really self-aware. You have to be like, ooh, I have like, we'll just go with the cliche, the pit in my stomach. Or I always say I get an elephant. It feels like there's an elephant on my chest. Or I feel like I can't, like so I just have to yawn. Yeah. yeah, yeah, in my throat. And then I want to yawn, but I don't need, it's like a stress yawn. Um, so it's recognizing that. And then- just stopping, recognizing it, taking some deep breaths. Sometimes, you know, if you're familiar with meditation or want to get into that road, sometimes just taking five minutes and breathing. And for me, meditation is being aware of what comes up when I become quiet and still. Just be aware of those thoughts that come up because that's when you're going to hear your story that you might not realize is playing in the background is when you become still and quiet. And then journal. Like, what is true here? What isn't true here? What am I adding? And just once you start, once you put and pen on paper, it's not typing, it needs to be pen on paper. Um, and you start writing, it's really amazing the things that come out and the shift that you can feel. 
it's true. I've experienced that. And, you know, anybody who wants to poo poo that or they don't have time, just carry a little notebook in your purse or your bag or your backpack or whatever, and have one in the kitchen nearby. Like mm -hmm. as, as that hits you, even if you just jot down a few words, I think, you know, I'm feeling this or this came up in mind. And then even if you have to revisit that later, you will be your mind and your subconscious will already start processing that. I love how you related this to the sensations you're noticing in your body. Cause Nikki, you mentioned that earlier that it, that's where we can start to tune in and realize what's going on that maybe we're stuck in. Yeah. I feel like therapy becoming normalized and the steps that we've taken as a society to recognizing how important our mental health is and that it does affect our physical and all of these pieces. We've done a really good job on the talk therapy where we can talk through our problems. We can intellectualize our problems. We say, I'm the queen of intellectualizing things. I can sit here and I can intellectualize everything okay. and I can talk myself in or out of anything. I'm, I'm really good at that because I've done a lot of therapy, but if I'm only doing it from the neck up, again, I'm actually doing myself a disservice. And that's where, yeah, if I stop, when I hit the grad, so yesterday I was backing out of my garage and I don't even know how it happened. I had a million things on my mind and I, my garage door was not fully up and crash. And I was like, uh oh, what did I just hit? And then I'm like, my garage door, how did I hit my garage door? And the anxiety that instantly filled my body, I had to stop and, you know, five years ago, especially 10, 15 years ago, I never would have even known what was going on in my body, but it was like, whoo, that's a lot. Okay. Yeah. This really sucks. But like breathe Nikki, nobody died. The garage door is fixable, but I was also my way to Calgary to get which tires put on my car. So I had a time crunch. My garage door went close. So how do I leave? My garage door is open and there's nobody home. So the anxiety was very real. And I just stopped, literally just stopped, put my car in park for about five minutes and just sat there and just digested everything that happened and felt all of the anxiety and everything. It was like, okay, now I can, I know what to do. I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to call Red Deer Overdoor. They were fantastic. They were here within the hour. They fixed it while I was on the road to Calgary. It was fine. But those few minutes of what I felt in my body, it was not fine. And if I would have ignored that, it would have, it's, it would still be here. Still be there. It would have been with you on the road, on the yes. highway while you're driving. It would have been with you when you and your daughter had dinner together later in the day. It would have been there when you picked her up, showed up at school. That would have been there, the energy that you would have brought. And that would have built and built. And who knows? Like Who knows? Um, and that's just it, right? And yeah, and if you're not aware, you don't even know what energy you're bringing into interactions with your loved ones or someone at the grocery store. Like you, you have to be aware of your energy. You have to be aware of what you're feeling in your body. And I'm just going to bring this in because uh, if anybody doesn't know this, you're quite the equestrian. Um, <laughs> and your horse would have definitely, definitely picked up on that. And you'd probably been piled in the dirt because he wouldn't have wanted any part of that. Yes. Um, they're very intuitive. So it is something that um, we definitely need to be aware of. I, I love that you shared that example and that it's so current. And that even you are still human. You have done the work you continue it's doesn't it never ends but mm -mm. it's more it's quicker and more successful and and that was a lesson again that reinforced what you've learned yes. is being okay where did this come from is it necessary to have it at this level how can I breathe through this yeah. so and good. what's real like what is real because my brain goes into the I think I mean being human what if so as I'm sitting there in my car panicking, what if someone goes in my garage door and breaks into my house? What if, what if, what if? And it's like, whoa, what are the chances? Like, what is yeah. true in this, right? The guy's going to be here in an hour. My neighbor knows he's going to keep an eye on things for like the short period of time that I can't be here until the guy gets here to fix it and like all these things. And so when you actually come out of that spiral and go, oh, wait, <laughs> what's real and what am I making up? And I had made up this whole big story that someone was going to break into my house in a matter of hours in the middle of broad daylight in a great neighborhood and go into my house. Yeah, not really realistic. 
but fear, right? That fear that drives those what ifs, that fear that yeah. drives so much of it. Again, it's just really getting real with yourself and be like, yeah, is that really going to happen? That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I've found, and, and Nikki, you can comment on whether you found this too, that once you start doing this kind of work, you will start in retrospect, look back to reactions you've had in the past and kind of work through them. Because sometimes, again, there's that shame and guilt and failure of how you could have done better. You did the best you could at that time. But would it help to look back because you're still thinking, you're still disappointed in yourself for the way maybe you reacted or overreacted. And it's a way to let release that is go back and, you know, let's journal through that. Let's think through that. If I could go back there now, how would I do it different? Give myself grace. I did the best with what I knew at that time, but then let it go. I think that's a big part of it. I think it's, yeah, accepting you did the best you could based on who you were in that moment. And sometimes it's even thanking that version of you. Um, I have an amazing therapist and one of my favorite sessions with her, as I was talking about my anxiety and I was really frustrated with my anxiety. And like, now I'm at this stage in my life, I don't need it anymore, but I'm still anxious. Why am I, why do I still have anxiety when I don't have any reason to? And we had a really great conversation around how my anxiety served me and how my anxiety yes. made me successful and pushed me to survive everything I needed to survive. And now just being able to recognize, hey, I don't need this anymore. What does that look like if I actually thank it and say like, thank you, anxiety, or thank you, whatever that, you know, if, if you had to make yourself numb to survive something, mm -hmm. right? Thank you for being able to do that in the moment. I don't need to do that anymore, but thank you. And that was like huge. And I think sometimes we just need to go back and acknowledge ourselves, thank ourselves. And yeah, it's okay to say, you know, the me of today would have done that different. But that's okay, because the me of then did the best she could. And now the me of today knows going forward, how I would do it different. And it gives us a sense of the accomplishment that we, you know, where we are now, we can celebrate that. Oh, my gosh, I would do that differently. Now that's a sign of growth. That's encouraging. I'm going to keep I'm going to keep working on it. This effort is worth it. I'm worth yes. it. My peace yes. of mind is worth it. <laughs> yes. And the biggest thing I'm finding in, in this coaching, like this piece is quite new to me, but the biggest thing I found in all of my conversations with women, not just going through a divorce, but especially I think it really comes up when we're going through the divorce is we really don't trust ourselves. No. Somewhere along the way, we stopped trusting ourselves, whether it was when we were five years old, 15 years old, whatever time in our life, whatever is going on. We don't trust ourselves. And I've always said, I love myself. But when I really looked at it, I'm like, but do I? Because what? if I don't trust <laughs> myself, if I don't, right? Like, do I actually love myself? So I think a huge part of the divorce piece as women is learning to trust our intuition, our gut, whatever you want to call it. And taking those couple minutes too, and just be like, ooh, maybe I need to listen to that little, that whether it's the voice, the gut, whatever it is for you. Um, we need to stop and listen to it because very rarely steers us wrong. That's powerful. And I think because we feel we've failed, we really struggle with that trust piece. You know, how, you know, I look at all these bad choices I made. <laughs> yeah. Can, can I trust myself? Can I trust myself? And that's part of the, like you said, the looking back. It's okay to look back as long as we're doing it from the right place. If we're looking back to shame ourselves more, if we're looking back to, you know, guilt ourselves more, then no, we don't want to do that. But if we're looking back to be like, you know what? Thank you. And you did the best you could. And I'm proud of you. And now we might do things differently, but yeah. Love it. Where can people find you, Nikki, to reach out and learn more about the coaching that you're offering now? Well, I'm just really getting started with all of this. So I don't have any social media or anything yet. So I have my email, which is Nikki, N-I-C-K-I at healing you first coaching.com. Um, and then you can obviously reach out over phone as well. And you can, I'm sure you can share my contact info um, on there, but phone number um, or email. And I am working on a website and I am working on social media and all of those pieces. I just just not quite there yet. <laughs> no problem. We will 
add the contact information in the show notes so people can reach out to you and they can keep checking for updates. I'm really, I'm really, I'm proud of you. <laughs> I'm celebrating you for following your instincts, for trusting yourself to follow this passion path that was obvious to you once you really leaned into it and knew that this was where you needed to go with this. And it's going to be such a gift to women who are experiencing these stages of divorce and figuring out who they are, what they love, what they want, and how to trust themselves. Yeah. And again, the trust is such a big thing and shame. Like I always use the example and you mentioned my horse. I was in a riding lesson and I was just taking a course on shame and uh, Brene Brown, I love her. And it was Brene Brown's course. Um, and uh, I had a jump lesson on my horse and we had just jumped our course and everything was great. And I was just going to circle him to slow him down and get him stopped. And as I was circling him, I didn't realize like we were going towards a jump. But to me, we were circling in front of the jump. I didn't realize that he completely locked onto the jump. And by the time I realized it was, we were in no man's land and like we almost just ran right through the jump we miscommunicated so badly and my coach was like how did you not realize he locked onto that and internally I instantly went into like you are the worst rider in the world why are you doing this your horse deserves better you're terrible you suck like and I just whoa it's like no you made a bad decision you stopped riding for five strides you made a bad choice you are not terrible it was one, right? But it was that shift from why am I even doing this? My horse deserves better. I'm the worst uh -huh. to no, I made a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And let me tell you, I do not let him lock onto jumps anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely learn from it. So it's that internal story that we tell ourselves around shame. Because shame is the I'm terrible, I'm the worst rider ever. My horse deserves better. Taking responsibility and looking at it differently is oops, made a mistake. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Well, and that happens in parenting quite often. Yes. You know, we're learning, yes. we're learning to be, to parent as our children grow. And that doesn't so end when they're adults. Thing. I'm still learning. Oh. <laughs> well, and I think that's, and especially for women, you know, the, the mom guilt, right? I mean, there's a reason there's a word for it. And yeah. And then same thing. We have a moment with our kids and, oh, I'm the worst mom ever. And we go into that story and it's like, no, that was a bad mom moment. I'll do better next time. And then you can, you have the awareness to say to your kids, Hey, I'm really sorry. Like I should not have said that. I should not have yelled. I'm sorry. And yeah. And then you, everyone gets to move on. I love that. Do you have any parting words for the listeners or any tools that they can find to get started right away? Um, do I have any tools for like, I have so many tools. This is such a, <laughs> a tough, I'm like, Oh, which, which, one which would be the first. I, I honestly think it's journaling. Yeah. I think it's just making the conscious choice to be like, I want to be aware of what I'm feeling and where and the story in my mind that goes along with that feeling. So just the ability to pause when you need to pause and then journaling, even if it's five minutes in the morning or five minutes at night, just journaling what you were feeling, what you're feeling and start identifying where it is in your body. Now, this comes to mind. We hear about journaling from a lot of people. We've been hearing about it for years. But many are actually intimidated thinking there is a right or wrong way to do this. And there's some type of magic process. They just dive right in and start just, just gushing, right? Like just right. Yeah, it it's identify. So, you know, like using that, the mom example, right? So you have a bad mom, a moment as a mom. Let's say you yell at your kids and it maybe wasn't justified and then you're feeling really bad. So it's like, get out a pen and paper and write down, like, I just yelled at my kid just that's just write that and then see what comes up because i guarantee you if you pay attention your that voice inside your head is gonna start talking at you and even if it's really awful you start writing because then you can as you're writing you can be like oh wait is that actually true and then journal on that is that true no that's not true right and just like let it keep going and there are some questions like a big one what is the story here what is true um can i change anything what like you can start asking yourself questions depending on the situation, but it really is just putting a pen in your hand, piece of paper, recognizing what just happened and then let it go. And if you do it a few times, your hand will not be able to keep up 
with everything that you want to say. That's very true. And I think what with they what you're going to start experiencing out of that is moments like you did on win on your horse where you're going to do that process quicker you're going to do it in your mm -hmm. head because yes. you practiced going through that and going oh i'm a terrible rider blah 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 or i'm a terrible mom whatever it is and you've gone through this you've written this down you've worked through it and then you and then instantly you're going to go to oh but is this yes. true wait a minute wait a minute, I, I made a mistake. And that that all happened in matter of like two strides of my horse. So we're talking seconds, where I went from you're the worst to huh, sorry, buddy. <laughs> That's on me. That was bad. Like I, I did not ride that well. I won't do that again. But it was a matter of seconds. And the, like you said, horses are so sensitive. He like we hit the fence. And he was like, Oh, my God, what just happened? And then two strides later, once I processed my stuff, he was like, okay, like he was over it too. They're so in the moment that yeah. he had his moment. I had my moment. And then we were both over it and on we went. And I mean, we had a good laugh about it because looking back how I did not notice that he was locked on that jump. Like my coach is like, you do actually need to do that better. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I find, yeah. I think that's how it is with our kids too. And they, you know, we don't have to stay locked in that moment where you've just no. caused this tension because you you yelled and maybe it wasn't warranted, and and then you feel like, well, now I now I identified it at this moment and I've set this tone. I have to you know stick with it. No, you can set no. an example and you can apologize and laugh it off with your kids and go, whoa, I don't know know where that came from. Let's start yes. over. And I think you know we always talk about the being human part, and we forget that so many times. It's like for some reason we think that we're not allowed to make mistakes, but that's the beauty. That's actually the beauty of being human is we get to make mistakes. We get to recognize those mistakes and we get to learn from those mistakes because we actually have the ability to do those things. So, so many times we're like, Oh, I'm, it's, I'm only human. And it's almost like a negative thing. And it's like, no, I'm only human. Like I, I'm mm -hmm. only human in a good way. I'm going to make mistakes because I'm human, but then I'm going to own them. And I'm going to apologize if I need to apologize. And then I have the ability to move on. Perfect. Thank you for your time today, Nikki. Again, it's such a pleasure to hang out with you. I feel like we could definitely keep talking for another <laughs> hour or two. Um, I know. <laughs> but I do invite everyone to please reach out and connect with Nikki and see if there is a way that she can help get you through this. Or if you know somebody, somebody you care about or are concerned about that could use a friend in their corner, somebody who has their back and help walk them through this uh, difficult challenges of divorce, then please share that with the women in your life that really could use this kind of support. Thank you again, Nikki. Thanks for having me, Dina. Always a pleasure. I hope you found that conversation insightful, encouraging, and also a reminder to all of us that what we see isn't always as it appears. People are going through a lot of things in their lives and we would want that compassion shared to us and that is something that we can offer to others without judgment. Instead, be curious and, and reach out, reach in, figure out a way that you can make someone's day a little better and it might just start with a smile. I thank you very much for spending your time with me here today and I encourage you to please subscribe to the podcast Follow us on social media. Check out our events. We have lots of ways that we can help you or someone that you love. Share this with a friend. If there's someone that you know could benefit from this. And hey, keep smiling that beautiful smile because the world really does need your sunshine. It means a lot that you spend this time with us and meet our experts and professionals who can help you through whatever life changes you're facing please refer to our Terms of Service available on our website, lifechangesmag.com. The link is in the show notes. Our disclaimer, Divorce Magazine Canada, Life Changes Magazine and Channel, and Divorce Resource Groups are intended to educate and provide quality, credible resource information. The contents should not be used as factual until consultation with the appropriate professionals for any guidance. Divorce Magazine Canada, Life Changes Magazine, and Life Changes Channel, as well as the Divorce Resource Groups, do not constitute endorsements for, nor liability, for any claims made in the presenting of this information.